Thank you everyone for your attendance today. Uh, my name is Nicole Rovino. I am an admissions officer here for the online programs of applied learning at Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health. Today we'll be discussing our population health management program. Joining us today will be Dr. Mark Biddle, director of the population health management program. Meredith St. Cyr, one of our graduates of the program and myself. My name is Nicole Orlino. I'm an admissions officer. I work with our team to assist students as they explore their options for continuing education. I am very excited to be presenting with these two today. Uh, Mark, I'll let you introduce yourself first. Thank you, Nicole, and welcome everyone. My name is Mark Biddle. I'm the program director for the uh, population Health Management Program. I uh, was the initiator behind its creation uh, back in 2017. We graduated our first class in 2019. Uh, and by this point, we have uh, almost uh, a little over 100 uh, alumni uh, from the program in just the last three years. So um, my background is uh, healthcare administration. I spent 35 years in uh, as a healthcare executive in a number of ambulatory and uh, physician practice settings. And most recently in the last six years, joined the faculty here in the School of Public Health um, to not only start this program, but I also run the master's in health administration program. So again, pleasure to talk to you about the program today and uh, look forward to your questions. Uh, Meredith, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Sure. Well, hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here. My name is Meredith St. Cyr. I'm a recent graduate. Um, I graduated back, I guess, last year, 2020. Um, and I've been in the field of healthcare for probably about 10, 10 years now or so in a variety of roles. And we'll go more into that in a, in a few slides. Perfect. Thank you, Mark and Meredith, for your introductions. To give everyone an idea of what we will be covering today, Mark will take us over the industry overview, really discuss why there was a need for this specific program, and to give you an idea of who the program is targeted towards. Uh, he will also be going over the program details and curriculum to give you an insight on what skill sets you'll gain and what sets our curriculum apart from other programs. Uh, our program is fully online, so Mark will give you an idea as to what online learning is like at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he will go on to discuss some of the program faculty and we'll hand it over to Meredith so she can share her experiences as a student in one of our programs. As for myself, I will go into admissions requirements, a tuition and financial aid, and details about the scholarship we offer. Uh, we will save some time for a Q&A at the end, so please feel free as you listen to the presentation to type out any questions you have into uh, the chat box, and we will cover those at the end with Meredith and Mark. Again, thank you so much for your time, and uh, Mark, please feel free to start. Okay, great. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so you can go to the next slide, yep. Uh, well, as you saw on the previous slide with my quote um, uh, about health services delivery landscape and the speed with which it was changing, um, that was a presentation that I gave back in 2016 to the American College of Healthcare Executives. It seems rather anticlimactic now to be talking about um, population health and population health management. Back then, 2016, 2017, when this curriculum was uh, program was developed and uh, we admitted our first class, uh, it was relatively novel. We were one of the only two schools in the country that was really focused on offering uh, a curriculum around population health and population health management. Um, you know, the basic genesis for it and what I talked about in 2016, what I continue to talk about now with boards of hospitals across the country is the, the need for us to move away from our traditional uh, fragmented siloed care delivery system that is focused on acute care. Once you get sick, we treat you. Um, and rather start thinking what lies beyond the four walls of our hospitals and health systems uh, to really think about how we can focus our energies more upstream as well as continue to do what we do well in the acute care environment. Of course, the payment models have been changing dramatically. The Affordable Care Act back in 2010 sort of set the stage for yet another, another evolution in our, our payment models uh, that really brought focus to increasing value right, reducing per capita costs, increasing quality, increasing patient experience. Uh, all of those things largely though have been focused on within the hospital or health system uh, and really don't address, uh, uh, we believe, a lot of what's required in a population health management model. Um, so this program is really designed to sort of build on that, build on the notion of what a value-based organization looks like, uh, and then take that another step further 
um, uh, to focus on social determinants of health and looking at what we can do to better collaborate um, within the healthcare environment, better collaborate with those outside the healthcare environment, like public health, like community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, to really bring the necessary attention to uh, what's driving poor health in our communities. Next slide, please. So the goal of this program or, or the fundamental design of this program was really to bring both sides together, the public health perspective. Of course, we're number one school of public health in the world. And so we're really looking at how we can leverage what we know about public health, but also what we know about healthcare delivery and the evolution of healthcare delivery. And we brought those two together in, into this curriculum around population health, population health management. Um, so the idea here is to really bring the best of, of healthcare, the triple aim, which with many people are familiar with, that's driving sort of this value-based notion, but also thinking about what the core functions of public health are and how we can integrate those to create a, an interdisciplinary curriculum that looks at not only how healthcare needs to be delivered today in contemporary times, but also how it needs to evolve beyond the four walls of the hospital and health system to, to truly incorporate care delivery uh, and health improvement in our communities. Next slide, please. So the program that we've developed is, is comprised of two parts. You can do just the first year of the curriculum and earn a certificate in population health management. Um, the curriculum is outlined for you here. It talks about, you know, uh, again, it's a fully online program. Um, there are two courses essentially offered each term. We, we operate in quarters or terms um, that are eight weeks long. So our academic year is comprised of four terms. <clears throat> so in, in term one, it's really the essentials of population health, you know, sort of what you're going to learn in the program. We've built a course around that to give you a flavor for all the elements that we think are important in developing a population health management strategy. Um, we have a, an advanced payment models course that really talks about uh, taking what we know about how to leverage uh, payment systems to change behaviors. We've seen this throughout the history of our, our healthcare delivery system. I like to say that we have exactly the healthcare system that we've paid for. Uh, it's very acute care oriented because that's essentially what we've paid for over the years. So if we want to change that, how can we leverage payment models to change behaviors uh, towards more of a population health focus? We talk about the importance of collaboration and how to do collaborations well across sectors, because this is a fundamental tenet to improving population health. Um, it's built into the culture of health framework, for example, in the uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation model. Uh, we have uh, an accountable care course that looks at quality and effectiveness. So how do you measure quality and effectiveness across a continuum of care that includes delivery elements that are outside the four walls of your system? Uh, we have a consumer health informatics course, uh, intro to epi, uh, a critical element to both population health as well as public health. Uh, we do uh, uh, offer a biostatistics class. We think it's important for students to be able to understand that they are making meaningful improvements, statistically significant improvements, and how to interpret the literature um, so that we are making the best decisions from an evidence-informed uh, perspective. And then finally, in uh, uh, term four, the first year, we uh, have a course on managing health across the continuum, which is, uh, again, largely focused on helping people to understand not only the things that we know well from a healthcare delivery perspective, managing the, the, our chronic patients, managing our patients that are within our four walls, but also thinking about how do we extend that to more lifestyle management um, programs that are, again, out in the community to help people stay healthy um, or prevent them from getting uh, a sicker um, in our community settings. So that's our first year curriculum. If you finish that, you earn a certificate. Uh, you can certainly enroll in our program just for the certificate. Um, next slide, please. Or you can enroll in our program for the master's program. You'll complete the fir same first year curriculum as the certificate students would, um, but then go on to complete year two of the program, um, which has additional courses that are um, 
again, building upon the first year courses. So we have courses in uh, what it means to develop high performance population health systems. Uh, we have health behavior courses. So understanding the, the importance of changing behaviors. And uh, as we talk about lifestyle changes, those are all behavior oriented types of, of uh, uh, areas that we have to focus on. We look at a systems approach. So again, thinking broadly across sectors on how to, how to leverage and organize uh, the strengths of all the different sectors that would be involved in improving population health. We have um, a wonderful course on behavioral economics, again, to think about how do we leverage um, economics, the behaviors that are associated with, with payment models to ultimately gain the types of responses that we, we need to influence uh, people's health. We have um, a leadership class uh, and a built environment class uh, that we think is important understanding the impact that the built environment has on health and how important that is to include in a population health management strategy. We have a, a social and cultural basis for community and primary health, since that will be one of the fundamental elements of change and as we think about behavior changes through primary and community health met means. Um, and then in the fourth term of the second year, uh, all master's programs require a capstone. We call ours an integrative activity, um, which students will participate in. It's an opportunity for the student to really bring to bear everything that they've learned through the program in this culminating activity. Um, it's a the program is, is based on you being a part-time student uh, and doing this online. So you have uh, between two years and four years to complete the master's degree, meaning that you could take two courses per term and complete the master's degree in two years, or you can complete one course per term and do the master's degree in four years. Um, the same thing applies if you're doing the certificate, you can complete it in one year by taking two courses per term or complete it in two years by taking one course per term. So we think it's a, a very manageable program, but I'll let Meredith talk about that in a few minutes um, as an alumni. Uh, it does require some focus. Um, if you're working full time, that's who this program is targeted towards well, in full time positions who are looking to better understand what it means to, to manage and lead population health and population health management programs. Next slide, please. So I, I've talked about this um, in general, uh, it, you, it's 25 credits for the certificate, 50 credits uh, for the, the master's degree. You have up to four years to complete the master's uh, degree, two years for their certificate. Um, very occasionally, um, it's been few and far between, but some students, particularly now with COVID, uh, we've had some students that needed to go beyond the four years uh, and that's perfectly manageable. We're able to work with students in, in those cases. Um, but for all intents and purposes, even with the pandemic, our students have been just remarkably um, uh, persevering in, in their efforts and uh, have been wonderful to work with uh, during this uh, difficult time. Uh, the courses I, I wanna uh, um, sort of bring mentioned to the program. It's a master's of applied science. Uh, and that applied piece is really critical. Uh, again, hopefully M Meredith can speak to some of this, but we really have built this program, uh, again, geared towards working practitioners uh, who as adult learners want information real time to help them do their job better. So every course that we offer, we feel is built on this notion of applied practical but evidence-based. So these are things that are, are clearly evidence-informed, evidence-based, um, and this is a, an area of continuing evidence development around population health and population health management, but also the ability to take it and apply it real time to what you're doing in, in, your, in your workplaces. So we, we pride ourselves on that applied nature of the program. Uh, part of that applied nature not only comes from the curriculum and how we've designed the courses, but also from the faculty to themselves. I teach some of the courses, I've developed some of the courses, um, and I've, I've spent 35 years in healthcare. I've been in the ambulatory physician practice world, so I understand community-based care. I understand the impact of social determinants. Um, worked on a lot of programs in the early stages of population health management um, before coming here uh, to develop this program. But many of our other faculty, whom I'll review in a moment, uh, also are in the business. They're doing this every day as their real-time job, and they're bringing that knowledge to the classroom um, through these online courses. 
So um, the other thing that I think really benefits our students is the students themselves. We, we take pride in the students that we admit to the program. We do look for people with work experience, relevant work experience. Um, you don't have to have a title of, of president or vice president or director of population health, but certainly have an interest in and the ability to enhance the field of, of pu uh, population health. Um, and, and so a lot of the learning, in addition to coming from the faculty and the content provided in the courses really comes from each other. And, and the students do have an opportunity to really engage and, and, and bind as a cohort, if you will, uh, through this program. It's amazing that the fact that we have students from across the country, in many cases, other countries that participate in this program uh, and the opportunity they have to really learn from each other and what's happening in different states, you know, what people are doing that's working well. So a good deal of the learning we feel is uh, predicated on this group or peer uh, sharing that takes place. So you do participate in group activities, you know, even though it's a virtual uh, online program. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I mentioned that you don't have to have a title in population health to be in this program. But it's interesting, we have a number of people um, in executive level positions. We have at least four hospital presidents in the program at this time. We have a number of physicians and other clinicians in the program at this time, all of whom uh, are you know, actively engaged in some way of helping their organization transition to or understand what it means to transition to a population health or population health management strategy. Not only do we have individuals from within the healthcare delivery system, we have individuals um, from various other sectors, pharmaceutical sectors, for example, um, are engaged in the program. Many of them are looking at developing or have developed population health management programs within the pharma uh, sectors to really understand how to best leverage medication use in helping to keep communities healthy and how better use the medications to do that. So, so again, we, we really do strug, um, strive to bring together multiple sectors uh, in this program so we have a true interdisciplinary um, uh, approach to solving these population health problems because that's the only way to do them. So this slide just basically gives you an overview of, of uh, obviously what we know already today. Again, it's somewhat anticlimactic to talk about it um, because we know this is just a significant area of growth within the healthcare field. It, it's one of the primary areas of focus is really how do we create these strategies to improve health within our communities. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I've talked about um, you know, the, the evolution, what, what sort of got the program off the ground, the importance of the curriculum that we put together and the implied nature of that, uh, the fact that we've been very selective in bringing faculty together that represent a number of different disciplines, which I'll share, share with you in a moment, um, but also the applied nature of their background. So people with uh, relevant, uh, not only research, but also practice experience uh, to make this a very real, program, very practical program. The school as a whole has, has decades of online teaching experience. We have a center for teaching and learning uh, that works with each faculty member to develop their course. Uh, they provide guidance in, in making our courses um, consistent from course to course to course. So it's not like having to relearn uh, a whole new format than as you move from one course to another. The, the platform, the learning management system, the way we approach teaching, all of those are guided by some uh, very uh, longstanding principles that are upheld uh, through our Center for Teaching and Learning. Uh, we have synchronous and asynchronous sessions. So all of the classes are asynchronous in the sense of, of recorded lectures, much like this um, that you're seeing me on Zoom. Uh, but we also have synchronous sessions where we bring the, the students together uh, via Zoom uh, online. Um, usually in the evenings, uh, we'll have these synchronous sessions, typically two to three per class. Um, and, and it's an opportunity for students to engage with faculty, opportunity for faculty to bring in guest lecturers so that you could hear from other people. It allows us to really keep the content uh, as current as we possibly can uh, in those means. So it's a great way, again, for students to be engaged. We, I, I love this one, one quote from a student. They said, you know, it's an online program, but I don't feel like an online student. I feel like I'm, you know, actually right there and part of the program. 
Uh, and so again, we work hard to do that. And I think part of it is in the way we've structured our courses. Um, we're here to support you, our students. Um, and so, you know, there is a 24 seven help desk. Um, the faculty are available. Teaching assistants are available, uh, you know, for the courses. So again, it's not just like you're listening to a recorded session and then you're off to take a test or write a paper. Uh, this is, these courses are paced. You're, you're, you're given weekly information um, through lectures. There are assignments, you know, each week, um, depending on the course. And so it's really as if you were in a classroom from week to week to week. Uh, so we don't want people to really just sit down and listen to eight weeks worth of lectures in a one night and take a test and, and then feel that you've learned any of the material. Uh, next session, uh, slide. Uh, just one other point that I'll make about the previous is that all of our um, material, again, is on our learning management system. So, you know, it's there for you to go back to, you know, even after you finish the course and you're moved on to the next term, that, that material is still all available for you. Um, so as you're doing your integrative activity at the end of the year two, you have access to all the materials uh, throughout the entire program. So this is just a, a current list of our faculty. Um, uh, that uh, teach the courses that we offer. And I, I just show at the bottom the various departments that they're affiliated with, um, many of which are in health policy and management, but others in health behavior and society, environmental health and engineering, they teach our built environment course. Um, so again, many of these faculty not only um, come from different disciplines within the School of Public Health, but they also are um, working faculty in many cases. So David Baker, for example, is the executive director of population health for a large health system here in, um, in uh, Baltimore. Um, uh, Cyrus Engineer has, has spent a large part of his career also looking both domestically and internationally at um, building better healthcare delivery systems. Uh, he was a Baldridge uh, uh, reviewer as well for the Baldridge Quality Award. Um, uh, Megan Priolo is uh, a former executive director for uh, an ACO. Uh, um, and so again, what we've tried to do, uh, Ryan Moran uh, also is, is full-time in the public, uh, sorry, population health um, uh, world. Uh, Alvia Siddiqui is vice president of population health for Advocate Aurora. So again, we, we bring a combination of both practice oriented faculty, people who are doing this every day, uh, as well as research faculty like Dr. Huff, who teaches our behavioral economics, or, or uh, Ligia Pena, who teaches our uh, systems class, or John McGrady, who teaches biostatistics. So again, a good combination of both interdisciplinary as well as practice and academic uh, in our faculty mix. Uh, next slide, please. Well, great. Uh, so that's our program in a nutshell. Happy to answer questions uh, as we go through, but I'd love to turn it over now to uh, one of our uh, alum, and we're so happy to have her here to, to share her experience. Thank you, Dr. Biddle. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. My name is Meredith St. Cyr, and as I mentioned before, I'm a recent graduate of this program uh, back in 2020. I had to kind of think as time escapes us all now, I'm like, was it just last year? <laughs> but again, happy to be here. I'll start off with just a few uh, bullets about myself. Um, a little about me. I work now currently as a healthcare consultant and have been in the field of healthcare for about 10 years now. So in my current role, I work um, as a lead consultant for an organization called Willis Towers Watson. They're a global um, consulting firm. They do everything from employee benefits consulting to property and casualty to health management, retirement, things like that. Um, and in my role, I work with clients, which are organizations, both nationally and internationally, with their health management strategies. Um, we work closely with them to help contain their healthcare spend, to implement population health strategies based on the makeup of their uh, particular population. We also work very closely with insurance carriers, you know, HR teams, um, just to improve the health of their employee populations. And I will say, I really enjoy this role and I do get to implement a lot of what I learned in the program. As Dr. Biddle mentioned, it's the applied portion of it really is a hands-on approach where you can take um, the course material and apply it to your life and your you know, work life as well um, in different, you know, different scenarios. So um, that's been a pretty interesting and, and helpful piece um, among, you know, between the program and, and my career. 
Next slide. Um, I chose to be a part of, the, of this program for several reasons. I really enjoyed it overall. Um, firstly, I'll say it's the opportunity to be a part of a distinguished academic and research community. Um, it's really great to be part of, of Johns Hopkins. There's a lot of resources available for you. As Dr. Biddle mentioned, the, um, the faculty, the professors are really, really helpful and there for you. And they come from a really diverse background as well. So a lot of really important and helpful pieces to the program that help you in your, in your career. Um, in a lot of different areas. Um, there are very few population health focused master's programs. Um, as was mentioned, it's one of, I think, you know, a handful across the US. And I did really like the fact that this was an applied program. It's more hands-on. You can learn in different case scenarios, which can help you in your life or in any kind of role you'd transition to in the future. I will say also that the faculty were really, really knowledgeable. They had prestige, prestigious and diverse backgrounds. They really came from all you know, areas of, of health and population health. And if you had a question or an area of interest, there really was always a, a resource there for you to connect with. Um, so that was really helpful. And, and they really were there to help you. If you had a question of any kind, you always were supported in what you needed. The course format included virtual live talks with experts and industry leaders. This was one of my favorite parts of the course, being an online um, curriculum. It's kind of, it would be easy to feel, you know, separate and isolated, but these live talks really brought everyone together to communicate. It's where you got to meet, you know, face-to-face, -face, got to meet your professors, your colleagues and talk. And I, I've met a lot of my classmates, my cohort there, and I've stayed in touch with them. And, um, so that's been pretty cool, like, you know, that, that in touch with each other piece is, is important. Um, as mentioned before, the virtual model really helps with your work-life balance. I did work full-time and still do while the program was going on. So the online format really helped me to tailor when I did my work, whether it was, you know, you know, whether I, whenever it could work to get in, whether it was on the weekends or, or evenings, or if I needed to, to position that in different times, I was able to do so because of the flexible format. And lastly, the opportunity to virtually collaborate with other students from across the country, many of whom have extensive healthcare backgrounds. This was really cool. I think as you learn in the program, you would like to know what else is out there. And in your cohort, there are so many different people with different careers, different backgrounds. And that was a really um, important piece for me to, as far as networking is concerned, um, as Dr. Biddle mentioned, there's people, you know, all the way from A to Z in your, in your program, from, from practitioners to executives to other roles that you may not have heard of, but are interested in learning more about. So um, that was a really uh, great part as well. Next slide. Um, I have a few tips for success that I'll pass along. These help me throughout the program. Um, the first I will mention is to be mindful of deadlines, to try to work ahead of schedule. I like to try to work in advance, um, especially in this kind of a format. It has the ability, deadlines, and, and assignments to sneak up on you. So just try to be diligent with completing things, reviewing ahead of time when they're due, especially if you work full time like I did. It's certainly doable, but you just got to kind of stay on top of stuff to manage your time. Uh, don't be hesitant to reach out with questions. As I mentioned, everyone is really, really willing to help. They're excited that you're interested in, in, the, in the material. So um, reach out if you're needed, if, if needed. Um, also, I recommend to connect with your classmates. It's a bit different in a virtual environment. However, try to connect when you can. It can be valuable to meet others in the field that are going through the same experience as you, you know, and just kind of connect with them and learn from their, their experience as well. To think relationally between concepts and also relate to your own experiences. This circles back more to the applied nature of the program too. You may be surprised how applicable many of the concepts are to your current work or work in the past or what you hope to be doing in the future or even to your life experiences. So don't be afraid to draw upon that and to share your, your information. And lastly, allow yourself to be fascinated, keep an open mind, be open to learning new things and exploring the field in new depth or more depth. Um, there's a lot to learn and it's a, an exciting program to be a part of. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, thank you, Mark, uh, for all the insight into the different parts of the program and to Meredith for sharing her student experience. I'm now going to take some time to go over the admissions requirements. And if you are interested in moving forward, there are some important things you need to know about the admissions process. All our applications are processed online through SOFIS and SOFIS Express uh, to streamline your application. For our master's degree, the application is done through SOFIS and our certificate application is through SOFIS Express. The requirements for education are a minimum of a bachelor's degree from a regionally accredited college or university. The professional requirement is a minimum of three years of health-related experience. We do require a current resume or CV to be uploaded into the portal. The letters of recommendation requirements are one letter for the certificate application and three for the master's. The statement of purpose is going to be a big part of our application process. Uh, this is where you will be able to communicate to the admissions committee you know, why you are pursuing this program, what you hope to gain from it, and what your ultimate career goals are. For our international students, if English is not your first language, you may need an English proficiency exam. We do accept either the TOEFL or the IELTS. Uh, for those who have obtained their education outside of the United States, uh, it is a requirement that you undergo a course-by-course -course, uh, credential evaluation via World Education Services. Uh, we do encourage you to start this credential evaluation early to gather any required documents and to make sure that the evaluation uh, is done in a timely manner. Uh, we are very used to working with students on this at the Office of Admissions. Uh, so if this is something you need assistance with or have any questions about, uh, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll be happy to help you with that. Looking over the admissions information, um, our applications are reviewed on a rolling basis, uh, meaning you do not need to wait until the deadlines uh, posted on this slide to hear back from the committee with your decision. Our applications are now open for the fall of 2022. Uh, we do encourage students to apply early so you can receive your decision earlier and start preparing for that upcoming term. Uh, the application deadline to apply for the master's is June 1st, and our certificate uh, deadline is going to be July 1st, 2022. Uh, we are here to assist you through the application, so if you have any questions or concerns on the process, you do have that support system with us. Uh, we do only enroll once per year, uh, so this is important to know if you are excited about the program and you are ready to apply. Uh, to provide insight on the kind of investment you'll be making, we've listed our financial information here, as well as some information about the financial aid office for those who are eligible to use financial resources such as FAFSA. Uh, they will be your best resource to connect with um, on that. For the current school year, the tuition is 1,233 per credit. We do offer a partial OPAL scholarship that covers 474 per credit which leaves students responsible for the remaining 759 per credit. Uh, the scholarship is specific funding to our OPAL programs, which is our online programs of applied learning. If you are admitted into the program, you are automatically awarded the OPAL scholarship. Uh, there is nothing additional you will need to do in order to receive it. So if you are planning financially, you will want to plan for the 759 per credit it at the current tuition rate. Um, of course, keeping in mind our tuition rate and scholarships are reassessed each spring and any changes will be updated um, on the website. Um, so as promised, we have time for Q&A and we do have a couple questions coming in. And so if someone does not have a previous academic background in public health, are there any classes you recommend taking to prepare for the courses of the program? Um, I, so this is Mark, I can answer that. Uh, if you don't have any previous public health experience, and so I assume you're talking about uh, undergraduate level courses. Um, I think the one thing that we do look for, because we don't, we don't require a GRE or GMAT, um, we do look at, at your quantitative abilities. Uh, Biostats is uh, not an easy class, um, having taken it myself. Uh, years ago as part of my doctoral program. Um, again, I, I came at uh, my doctorate in public health without a public health background. It was, I had an MBA and, and worked in healthcare. But um, so I would say quantitative uh, coursework or at least preparation. Um, you know, so if you haven't taken a lot of our students in, in this program um, uh, are coming back for a master's degree, they, they may already have an MD or, or other master's degrees, but again, are coming back and may have been out of school for a while. 
Uh, so we do ask or encourage them to sort of brush up on their quantitative skills. Um, and so that would be important if you haven't, if you graduated from a program that didn't have any real quantitative skills, um, you know, it would be encouraged to, you know, take an introductory um, algebra, re refresh yourself on algebra, calculus, or, you know, uh, statistics. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. Um, as a person considering this program or an MPH, so Master's of Public Health, can you highlight some of the differences? So the, the main difference um, in my view is, so when you think about, um, as I mentioned earlier, the program was really meant to fun um, function as a bridge between public health and healthcare administration. Um, so as I, I oversee the master's in health administration program. Um, and I sort of look at the MPH and the MHA at, at two ends of a spectrum, right? Um, both of which are focused on health and health improvement, but clearly one is more around the healthcare delivery system, uh, where the other is more broadly defined to be uh, public health, which can take any number of different avenues, could be international health, health behavior and society. I mean, there are a lot of different disciplines that define an MPH. Um, so the, the population health management program really sits in the middle of those two, where we we draw from the knowledge, the core functions of public health um, and, and marry that with the, the, some key skills uh, around health administration as it relates to delivering a population health uh, management strategy. So uh, again, I think an MPH, it, it depends on what you focus on. You can get an MPH in biostatistics, for example, or an MPH in epidemiology. Uh, if you get a, gen a generic MPH, you still have to have some sort of you know, area of focus or concentration. And, and most of those are not going to give you, um, it, it depends on what school you go to, are not going to necessarily have the, the types of courses that relate to the healthcare delivery system in the way that we do. So again, this, this sort of builds off of what the, the master's in health administration type of a program and an MPH and combines them together in this population health management. Thank you, Mark. Uh, what is the expected time commitment for the program? Uh, and can you elaborate on what that looks like? Um, I'll maybe let Meredith start with that from a student's perspective. <laughs> sure. Um, as, as you can imagine, some classes take more, some take a little bit less, you know, time out of your week. I think, isn't it, I think the actual equation is like per credit hour, it's- you know, Yeah, I can, I can go into the academic. Yeah explanation, but just from your perspective. Yeah, I mean, there were certainly terms that were more work and less work, you know, as time went on. I don't know if this is a helpful explanation or not, but um, I would say, let's see. Oh, it's tough to say. I, uh, maybe like 10 hours a week or so-ish. Does that sound about right? Per course. Per course, per mm -hmm. course. Yeah, so um, the academic formula that Meredith was sort of talking <laughs> about is, um, looks at the number of credits. All of our courses are three credits with the exception of one, which is two credits. And then the integrative activity is four credits. Um, but uh, so for per credit, the, the basic rule of thumb is for each one credit in a course, there's three hours of work. So that essentially a credit is one hour. There's three hours of work outside, quote unquote, the classroom. Um, so if you if you think about the credit as sort of seat time, the time you would spend in a class, um, then there's additional time, you know, to do readings, do assignments, homework, et cetera. So for a three credit um, course, you can figure about, as as Meredith said, nine to 10 hours a week per course um, in terms of, again, the readings that you have to do, any assignments that you might have to do for that week. And it, it all depends on the course and, and the, the nature of the assignments. Most courses don't have like an assignment every week, although some courses have like mini assignments each week or maybe a quiz each week. Um, so again, it, it depends, but you can figure probably about, you know, nine hours a week per course um, in the program. And again, the way it's laid out um, you have the ability, you know, we basically look at it on a seven day a week basis. So it's, it's not like Monday through Friday, um, but rather we, we open a class on Monday morning and it closes Sunday night. 
at 11.59 p.m. So you have the entire seven days of the week to work on that week's activities. And then, you know, the following Monday, typically we open two weeks at a time. So you are able to, as Meredith says, sort of work ahead a little bit to look at the readings that are coming up, to look at assignments that are coming up, to listen to the lectures for the following week. So if you have a few extra, you know, hours or in a, in a week, um, you certainly can sort of get ahead of the game. Uh, that's how, again, we've designed this course to be very much friendly to people who uh, are working full time and going to school um, at night, quote unquote. And, and that's what I did. I did my master's degree. I worked full time um, at raising a family and, and I went to school at night for my master's. I did the same thing for my doctoral degree. I worked full time raising a family. I was teaching part time as well during my doctoral degree. So I, it, I very much, you know, built in my own experiences uh, as we formulated this program. Perfect, thank you. Uh, can you explain the integrative activity and give an example? So right now the integrative activity, again, it's a culminating activity. Every, every master's program, the MPH was mentioned earlier, I've mentioned the MHA, both of those have a capstone requirement. Um, we call ours an integrative activity. It's the same thing, essentially. It's a culminating activity allowing students to demonstrate what they've learned in, a, in, an, uh, in an applied way um, at the end of the program. So our integrative activity currently is a standardized case. So this, all students are given a case, the same case, and they prepare a, a generally a 25-page um, paper uh, in response to the case question. So it allows them to really analyze the case, to, to look at it through a variety of, of frameworks that, that they choose, um, uh, that they can pull from the various courses that they've taken, as well as bring in external uh, evidence and research to support their analysis. Um, and then they provide that case response uh, back to us there's a, um, a faculty preceptor assigned to that course. We treat it like a course. Um, and then there are four, uh, including the uh, preceptor, faculty preceptor, there are three other faculty that serve as readers for the cases. So the cases are, are reviewed um, by readers and assessed uh, for performance. Perfect, thank you. Um, if I have questions or problems with assignments, are there te uh, teaching assistants or a faculty contact I can connect with? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to answer the first part of that, but then I'm going to throw it over to um, Meredith to talk about accessibility um, to the faculty and TA. So yes, every one of our courses obviously has a primary faculty member. Um, uh, I'm teaching one of the courses this term, so the collective impact uh, course is ongoing as we, you know, speak, if you will. Um, and so, you know, every day I'm checking the discussion board for questions. I'm checking my emails to see if there are questions from our students. I have a TA assigned to me that's helping with the course. So she is also um, uh, actually happens to be an alumni of the program as well, and she's TAing for me. Um, and so between the two of us, we're constantly monitoring uh, the course site to see if students have questions so that we can respond to them in a timely manner. Um, if there's an assignment related question, um, you know, that would come to, uh, we, I generally ask that it come to myself and my TA that way one of us will hopefully see it, you know, quicker maybe than the other. Um, but in every case, our, our goal is within 24 hours that we're able to respond to you. Um, and unfortunately what that means is also on weekends for us. Uh, so, you know, when I, when I, the way I look at it, the way all of our faculty look at these online classes, uh, particularly with students who are working full time, you know, many times you, the, when you're working on the class might be the weekend, right? You know, because you're working all week and the weekend may be reserved for uh, your homework types of activities. I know mine was when I was in class. Um, so, you know, I, I pay particular attention um, seven days a week uh, for emails. Um, so that I can respond to a question who may, may email me on a Sunday morning to ask about an assignment. Um, so I will then, you know, sort of give it to Meredith to share, you know, her experiences having been through the program and accessing faculty or TAs. Uh, I certainly agree, Dr. Biddle, with what he was saying. I, I don't think there was, I mean, I don't, I don't want to 
set an expectation too high, but they got, all the faculty did get back to us very, very quickly. And, and usually I would just copy in a TA and one or the other, if I had a question, would get back to me quickly. And if more attention was needed, they would offer, you know, whatever help I needed to have, they would, they would coordinate for me, you know, um, just to make sure I really understood what the material was and I was headed in the right direction. So I definitely, um, I, everything you said was accurate for sure. <laughs> Good. Uh, thank you. Um, so this will be our last question for today. Um, so what are some networking opportunities available to students? Well, again, I'll start, but um, I think Meredith can share as well because she mentioned it earlier. But you know, I think one of the, the things that we uh, was, uh, I, I won't, I, I guess to be honest, it was an unintended consequence. Um, I don't think I really appreciated how well the students would connect in the program from year to year. So it's not technically a cohort program. We admit the, the program starts in, in first term, which is the end of August. And so if we admit 50 students um, that year, they all start you know, in one of the two first term programs, uh, classes. So they, some students take both, some students only take one. So they're not exactly on pace to complete the program together, but typically we've graduated uh, between 35 and 40 students each year. So, you know, just assume that 35, 40 students have largely been going through the program together. And because of, you know, the opportunities to engage in the, in the synchronous sessions, the live talks that we have, the group work. So not every class has group work, but, you know, we, Again, as faculty, we try and balance that so that, you know, if I'm teaching one of the two courses in fourth term and somebody else is teaching the other, we, we try not to have competing, you know, live talks. So we're, you're not having to pick which one to go to. We, we try not to have, you know, excessive group work to where you're just constantly in two different groups and getting confused. So we, we really do work well as a faculty to balance the workload from term to term, class to class. Uh, but Anyway, the, the opportunity, I think, to connect via classes um, ha has been really remarkable for me to see how students have, have connected, developed relationships that have, you know, gone well beyond uh, the program that, you know, continue to this day. Either, uh, you know, I get uh, emails all the time from alumni, you know, sharing things that they're doing or asking me for my advice or, you know, just wanting to chat and follow up, which I love. Um, but I also hear from the students as I'm talking to them or alumni, as I'm talking to them, that they're continuing to stay in touch with each other. And so you, you are building a network. Again, it's, it's a growing network of, of alumni um, now that you have the opportunity to connect with through this program. So Meredith, your thoughts? Yeah, sure. Um, I agree with, with the fact that you are saying that um, not everyone starts and finishes and does the same classes at the same time um, to the point where when each class I was in, it felt like not a, a new you know section of students, but there were definitely familiar faces and then some new folks in each class. And not only was there group work where we worked really closely, there are discussion posts where you read other people's opinions and then you make comments. You just kind of get to know other people's lives, their work experiences and, and things like that, which is really helpful. And again, that's over the course of, you know, months. And, and sometimes if there was, you know, a question I had and I, there was a, a woman or a colleague or whoever from a few courses back that I remembered we had, you know, a conversation about something the network was there to, to draw back on um, and would be into the future too. So we def I definitely made a lot of connections that way, um, just because we're all learning together, going through the same experiences. Um, and also on the live talks, like we mentioned too, was a good opportunity for us to, to expand our network. I will just say too that we had a lot of guest speakers in a lot of our classes too that would come on and, and not only with that, um, there was a lot of just people in general resources that you, you know, the connections that you would make along with your classmates and the professors and things like that too. So I would say a, a lot of opportunities given the virtual environment. Perfect, thank you. Um, so thank you all for your attendance today. If we didn't get to your questions, we will be connecting with you um, offline. Our team at the admissions office will contact you directly in the next few days and assist in answering your questions. Um, if you want to connect with someone immediately, my contact information is on the slide here. 
So feel free to reach out via phone or email. Um, if you are excited about this program and see this as a part of your future, uh, please feel free to use the scan codes here to move forward uh, with your application. We have our team looking forward to working with each and every one of you uh, throughout the application process. Uh, but thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Biddle and Meredith for your time today. Nicole, thank you. We're really uh, appreciate all the work that your team does to support our program. And Meredith, thanks for being here. Great to see you again. Yeah, thanks for having me.